Greetings, brothers and sisters. So I talked about change, the need for people to change. Times are changing and people need to change as well. And I was talking about this in a video yesterday, but I was like uh, not satisfied with the results. I wanted to cover the subject um, separately here. So the first part about this is that in terms of the American lifestyle, the modern, not just American, but this is something that's been pushed out there globally, but America was the prototype. And I've talked about this part before that when our ancestors were convinced to leave the farm, forced off the farm or whatever it was, they were multi-functioning people that had to do all kinds of different things to survive. You know, the farm, the tribe, whatever it was, right? They were much more developed people, even though they're considered primitive, right? Most people look at the, you know, the homesteaders and, the, and the, you know, the homesteaders as stupid farmers and the native peoples as primitive. I mean, that's what we grew up believing, right? They're so primitive, we're much more evolved. But in fact, they had so many more skills than us. I learned this when my family and I started a homestead. The amount of skills, the skill level, the functioning level, and I'm not just talking about farming or hunting or any of these kind of things. I'm talking about just the fully functioning human being or much more functioning human being. Just more aware and just more fully developed and more human. Like I've talked about zoo animals, if you bring a, a wild animal into the zoo, the zoo animal is going to not function nearly as well. It's just, you know, it's lost most of its primary reason for being. Now it's just there to be you know, in front of people. And so that's what we are. Like, that's what modern human beings are. We're zoo animals. We're, you know, we're in captivity and we don't even know it. A captivity of our own choosing. And we look back at our ancestors and say, oh, look at how primitive they were. Look how wild they were, right? And we think that we've evolved in some way. I mean, that's what we've been told. And not that the, you know, these, uh, our ancestors were the pinnacle of evolution, it wasn't like they had evolved to become everything they could be. In fact, they were, in a sense, primitive compared to what we will become the next phase. And I want to get into that in just a moment. But they certainly were more, you know, f highly functioning than we are. They were more capable in so many different areas and levels and emotionally and psychologically and in terms of their relationships and their understanding nature and just so many different ways. They were much better than we are right now. Like, we're just lost. We're, you know, we've regressed. And the reason we've regressed, if you understand your work, right, what people consider their work, when you have one specialized skill that you receive monetary compensation for, and you call it your work, but it's not really your life's work because it's just something that you're contributing to the beastly system. It's not pulling out of you your full potential, right? It's not pulling out, but even in that, on that limited level of your task, right? The tasks that you've been assigned, even in your job, you're not encouraged to master your job in the sense that like it's some, you know, you're going to reach some pinnacle. Probably within a couple of weeks to six months, you can do your job well and maybe not as good as some other people. And there's limited upward positions, right? That's how our system works. It's a pyramid. And the higher you go, the less people fit in the capstone of the pyramid. You know, the higher you go, the less room there is for people like other people. And so it's a very, it's narrowing. And so the amount of people that can fit in the upper management, the upper levels is limited. And so, you know, there needs to be a lot of people who end up not going anywhere, right? They have one job, they do that, that singular task that became boring 20 years ago, right? You, you know, you got everything out of this task in terms of personal growth. You're not being challenged. You're not, it's not pulling anything out of you. It's not, you know, stimulating it more of your potential just in terms of that one little area, that one little expression of your so-called work, right? So it's not really your work. I mean, you can't call it your life's work. Very few people have a real career. Like very few people have a job that challenges them 
that is, you know, pushing them to become more and become better, right? There are some people that are going to excel on a materialistic level, on a, you know, in terms of a career or a job, and they're going to make it into the upper echelons of their profession. They're going to be really great at what they do. But for most people, it becomes boring, or at least it becomes mindless. You can do your job in your sleep kind of a situation. You know, my sister had this friend and she was a complete screw up, right? Like just, uh, you know, messed up emotionally and just, you know, under functioning. And my sister was 10 years older than me. So this is maybe I'm in, you know, high school when this happened, a little bit younger. I don't know. But um, her friend got a job after college. So I'm probably 13 or 14, maybe. And the job was back then, like they didn't have computers like we have now like there was a computer in my high school and it was the size of two refrigerators and it did almost nothing <laughs> like like it's amazing how much uh technological advancement there's been in terms of computers where now the phone i have is like millions of times more uh, powerful than the computer in my high school but anyways this you know this young woman at the time got a job where, you know, in books where there would be the chapter and then at the end of it would be a number, right? Like a number, you know, the page number. You know, the chapter starts on page number 45, whatever it was. And there's these dots. And she typed the dots between the two things. I couldn't believe that there was a job that did that. I'm like, why did they just print it, right? I'm not sure even how, you know. I, I don't even know why that job existed. But the reason I know this is because my sister's friend was hysterical one day and I asked my sister why and she said, well, she does this job and one of her co-workers said to her, a monkey could do what you do and she completely lost it because, you know, I mean, she did this very remedial job. And then I had, um, my dad had three sisters, you know, my dad was half Sicilian and half Albanian. And there's just a lot of darkness, like a lot of negativity and, you know, ickiness. I mean, I didn't understand this when I was a kid because I just, you know, kids don't see these things. But then when I looked back at it and I understood some of the family history, there is just a lot of, you know, anger and darkness and negativity in that side of my family. Like both sides of the family has some messed up stuff, like, you know, because you know, people are messed up anyway. So my dad was, um, you know, the lone male in a, in a, you know, family with three sisters. And he was the only person to go to college. His youngest sister got married to a security guard. And he had two other sisters. And they lived at home their whole life. They didn't really have, I don't think, any kind of a social life. They ended up taking care of my grandparents. One of them was a VD nurse. She worked in some sort of I don't know, like a uh, like a VD clinic her whole life, which was probably a pretty horrible job. I mean, these, they never got married. They never, you know, they didn't have any sort of what I consider a real life. But the other sister had even a worse job. She worked for Singer Sewing Machines on the manufacturing line, and she would count the amount of needles that would go into a box, which to me would be excruciating. I mean, she did this for like 40 years. But the kicker was that she would get there over an hour early. So this is in New Jersey, cold ass New Jersey, right? Just a really cold, you know, I mean, it's a northern city. And she would get there like, you know, before, I mean, she'd leave in the dark to get there at like 6.30 in the morning to start her shift at 7.30 or something like this. And she would get there before anybody else, get to the plant before anybody else. So she could get her favorite parking spot and be the first one out of the lot. <laughs> so she would start, I mean, no, you know, she, whatever her commute time was, but she would add an extra hour and just sit in her car waiting to count needles. Right. And then would go home and have no, you know, no romantic life. No, you know, no friends or, I mean, just, I don't know what to say about it. Right. And I knew this, I don't know, you know, where the time frame of my understanding my my aunt's lives, right? This, um, but I remember being in the basement of their house. They had like a cuckoo clock where a little bird would come out every hour and it would cuckoo, like it would go cuckoo like three times if it was three o'clock, right? 
my grandfather had owned a barber shop and he still had a barber chair in the basement and he was like long past being able to cut people's hair because of you know it was in his he died when he was in his 90s so like when he was in his 80s he didn't have the you know the eyesight and the ability to cut hair but it didn't stop him from practicing on his grandkids like i remember getting a haircut like bleeding <laughs> And so, uh, like, we drive, you know, from Connecticut to New Jersey and, you know, over the Tappan Zee Bridge, like, I remembered all these, you know, difficult things that happened in terms of it's a hard trip to drive through New York City or whatever it is. But anyways, I was sitting in the basement. They were watching TV. You know, we were in their house in New Jersey. And they were watching this show called Chips. And there was this actor named Eric Estrada. And I remember my aunts sort of like, I don't know, somehow they were, you know, verbalized he was good looking or something like that. I just looked at him like, oh my God, how sad, right? I mean, they're in their like 40s or, you know, maybe even close to 50. And I I realized like they had no lives, right? <laughs> like they just, you know. And so there's lots of people like that that are just supposed to be cogs in the wheel. And so their jobs, their work is unfulfilling. The job is in a sense beneath them. It's something they can do you know, they have so much more potential that's not being realized in their work. But that's made okay in our system because you're told your job is just for money, right? That you're working just for money and that money you're going to use on your free time. And so you have your, you know, work time and then your free time. And think about free time almost sounds like you're in a prison and you're let out for, you know, or you're in a military or something, and you're let out for a furlough, right? You're given a short period of time for, what do they call those things? Conjugal visits, right? <laughs> you have these conjugal visits in prison where you're allowed to, you know, go and have a, you know, hour with your spouse or something like this in a private trailer or something. But it's, um, you know, a part of our system where you have your time where you're you know, you're paid to do some task for the beastly system. And then you have bought, you just paid for your free time. And you can do things on your free time. And you're going to indulge. And what makes this system work is the more you hate your job, the more your job is boring and difficult to get through, the more you look forward to your free time. And your job ends up being, you know, and I suffered this when I was working as a counselor, that your job sucks so much of your life force up that you, you know, I worked as a counselor in treatment centers and I went back and got my, my first, I went and worked in the milieu. I had a master's, I had a bachelor's degree in human services. I worked at one treatment center. Then I got married and I went back to school and got my master's degree. And then I worked at another treatment center with basically the same population as a clinician. And the job was so life sucking. Like it's, the average span of employment for my job was like seven to nine months. And I lasted there, I don't know, three or some years, maybe, you know, three and a half years, something like that. And my coworkers were breaking down. There's a guy who got hired maybe two or three months ahead of me. And he was leaving and we were, I was walking across campus. I said, I hear you're leaving. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, what's happening? He goes, I'm breaking down psychologically, physically, mentally, right? <laughs> Like he was, he's losing his hair and, you know, like just everything. And I, you know, I knew everything that he was talking about because it was really highly stressed. And oftentimes we wouldn't have enough clinical staff. So we'd have to pick up a bigger caseload and run groups instead of a 12 kids, 24 kids, which is insane. Like group therapy with 24 kids is like crazy, but it was just something that the place was so, you know, it was just a nightmare to work in. And my boss was having these migraines and she was taking like some sort of like morphine shots. Like I later found out her migraines were so bad. She was so stressed out and the place was so dysfunctional, right? And it just sucks the life out of you. And by the time you get home and during that time, my family and I was living in a cockroach infested apartment and there was just all these issues, you know, with my marriage and just the stress level. And so you can't even like catch a breath, right? You can't even, can, you know, have enough time to come up with a plan and have the energy to execute that plan to extricate yourself out of that situation, right? I mean, that's what happens to people. They can't figure a way out 
of their situation because their job is sucking so much energy out of them because it's so unfulfilling and it's so, you know, in many ways demeaning and the energy level that's sucked out of you in terms of your, you know, and it's so much of your time. If you if it's 40 hours plus another 10 hours of travel or whatever it is back and forth, and then you have to get food and, you know, shop and, you know, do all the, the other things you have to do. And then, you know, spend time with your kids and your family and all these things that you're so drained all the time. Like you just look forward to, you know, those brief moments in your weekends and your free time to do something that just is, you know, get away from the stress. I mean, this is why the, you know, brilliant things and wonderful things about the heartfulness system. It helps you to like gather yourself. Like when you play basketball and you're like dribbling down the, you know, you're running fast and you're dribbling the basketball and you're about to like go up for a layup. They call it like gathering yourself, right? You have to sort of gather yourself. You have to slow down enough. And, you know, if you're going too fast, all that energy is going to go into your shot, right? You're going to try to lay the ball up, but you're running really fast. So the momentum will make the ball like, you know, careen off the backboard and go to midcourt, right? Not even close to coming in because you're flying, right? You got to, you know, you're going as fast as you can. So you have to sort of gather yourself and slow down and then, you know, put some finesse into the layup so that there's not all this force going off the backboard, right? People need to gather themselves. The second master of the heartfulness system, Babaji, said, you know, I had to adjust myself before going up to the next level when he was being brought through the various spiritual points and his journey guided by his spiritual master. He said, I had to adjust myself and, you know, prepare myself for the next phase he would anticipate the next phase of his spiritual evolution and adjust himself accordingly so he'd be ready and, you know, he wouldn't be... Because when you're going on a spiritual journey, oftentimes energies come into you and, you know, there's maybe powers or what they call cities and S-I-D-I-H-I-S, I believe is how it's spelled. These are like spiritual powers and things, whatever it might be, and you have to prepare yourself because, you know, it can be overwhelming. Many people have evolve spiritually and then just get overwhelmed by you know all these things opening up in them potential opening up and and they get overwhelmed but in terms of what i was talking about in people's work life there isn't much time between you know enough time and energy for people to adjust themselves and gather themselves and then make a plan to extricate themselves out of you know the hell that they're living so they just have these moments where you have some free time, a vacation, where you can clear your mind, you get away from where you're living because you built up these constructs. You know, one of the things about the heartfulness meditation, you're supposed to meditate in the same spot at the same at the same time every day. It's the first maxim of the heartfulness system because you're building up an energy, you're building up a connection with God, you're setting up a daily appointment with God to me through the transmission and through the heartfulness meditation that you're, you know, you're there at the same time, the same place every day, and you're building up a field, an energetic field on a spiritual level and also on a physical level. And it starts changing the atmosphere of your house and all these things happen when you do that. You're, you know, including God, you're meeting with God and you're connecting with God as you start your day. And routine is really important like what you do on a daily, in terms of your daily routine. And if your daily routine involves anger and frustration and angst and bitterness and, you know, failed, I'm feeling like a loser. I mean, all these negative things, right? Emotional, negative emotional things and mental thoughts. And you're just having those thoughts and feelings every day as you drag yourself out of bed, you you know, you tromps off to work, you know, <laughs> you drive to work uh, and all these things. I mean, this happened to my dad, who was, um, you know, a guidance counselor, and we moved about an hour away or 45 minutes away from his school. He worked in an inner city school, and he complained about the drive, like every morning, and, you know, it was actually kind of a beautiful drive, but, you know, and he just couldn't wait to retire, and this happens to people. I said this before, you know, you know, very recently I was talking about this, but people retire, and then they have no purpose at all, right, because they don't have... You know, they're not there to guide their families. Like, nobody looked at my dad as somebody they would go to for advice. Like, you know, like, 
I don't think, um, I don't remember the, you know, the last time I looked at my dad as a, a resource for somebody who, you know, would, would tell me some good information on what I should do with my life. Like, I don't think, you know, maybe when I was a little kid, you know, you know, I, of course you look up to your dad when you're a little kid, but at some point, you know, between the ages of, I don't know, eight and 14, I lost like all, you know, respect for my dad in terms of being a person that I could go, f go to for a problem or, you know, that would come up with solutions or was functioning in any sort of a way. Right. I mean, I looked at him sort of like he was a child. And so he didn't have anything to offer his kids or grandkids. He was angry and sort of bitter and things like this. And he started to fall apart psychologically. My mom was always worried. You know, she said he's just watches the news and gets angry and swears. And, you know, he started to become like more, you know, racist and, you know, just angry and just whatever it was, right? Just looking at the TV and getting angry and, you know, saying all these things. And my mom and my grandmother, who ended up living with them at some point, my grandmother lived to, I think, 98 or something like that, my mom's mom. And they were, like, scared at times just because he was just, you know, kind of losing it. And, you know, he played golf a couple of times a week. You know, he thought that would be, um, you know, a fun thing, but he couldn't keep friends. And, you know, he's just, um, you know, just kind of an, an a-hole. And so he had no purpose anymore. And he was just really scared of death, and he lingered on, right? He just lingered on forever. And, you know, when I last saw him, he was like, I mean, he had he always loved to eat, right? He had a big pot belly, you know, this Italian, he called it his labanza or something like this. <laughs> I don't know, it was like a, and, um, you know, he loved to eat. And, you know, he couldn't eat anymore because he had irritable bowel and, you know, autoimmune stuff. And so... um like he just shriveled down to nothing and he liked to watch TV and he couldn't see anymore. And he just was this like corpse, like this. I mean, when I saw him, I was like stunned, you know, it was just hard to see. And he just, you know, lingered on another year and a half after that. And he was just for the last 10 or 15 years of his life, he was, you know, living in fear of death, but he couldn't enjoy anything or anything like that. Right. Just sucking up resources and scared to make the transition, but having no real purpose on planet Earth. And so many people are like that. That's the, you know, death process. They work jobs that are unfulfilling. They don't develop a spiritual life or any sort of, you know, con contemplative life where they're, you know, thinking about bigger things. And, you know, they're just locked in as a cog in the wheel. And they get a little free time, a little daylight, a little vacation, a little, you know, some time on the weekend just to have you know, some moments to themselves or just some moments of, you know, happiness or just, you know, getting away from the job. So that's how they get you, right? They get you sucked in, suck your energy away from you. And then you're working for your free time away from your, you know, your slave to the beast type of, you know, 40 hour a week. And I said this, you know, it was this fake promise that they had that if you leave the farm, you're going to, you're going to leave all these skills and all this you know, stuff that was expected of you in your agrarian tribe, tribal existence. And now we're just going to make you work. You just had to work eight hours, whatever it was back then, 10, 10 hours a day. And the rest of the time was yours, right? And you'd have money and we'd have all these cool things you could do because, you know, we had a society now instead of just having your local village and your local town that had, you know, limitation. Maybe somebody plays the banjo, you know. Maybe there's, you know, somebody's a dancer, you know, something like that, you know. But, in, you know, somebody's a good storyteller and you're, you know, sit by the campfire. But now you had TVs and, you know, city life and plays and, you know, restaurants and all these things that you could go to and enjoy yourself. Amusement parks, you had all these things that were there to stimulate you. And now with the Internet, it's even more. And so you have this job that's unfulfilling and keeping you, you know, not developed. And then you have your free time where you're, you know, able to go and enjoy and you don't really develop as a person because during that free time, you don't think about self-improvement. You don't think about, you know, doing things. I mean, some people have some hobbies or whatever it is, but in terms of being a fully functioning human being on all levels, like that's, you know, that ship has sailed for almost everybody. And then in terms of your spiritual life, they say, all right, you have this, you know, you go to church once a 
once a week or whatever it is on Christmas Day or something. And you sit there and you just accept what we're doing. You pay some money and, you know, you accept Jesus. I mean, this is just, you know, for Christians, but this is all across the globe. This is what most religions promise. And we'll take care of you in your afterlife. You don't have to worry about your connection with God. It'll be through us, right? Our organization will connect you with God. And so you go there, you show up and, you know, maybe you think about, maybe you read the Bible a little bit. Maybe once in a while you think about God and you, you know, depending on, um, you know, whatever, you know, your level of involvement is, maybe you have some, you know, past life where you had, you were, you were a devotee and you have some craving to connect to God. So, you know, you're a little bit more into church than other people, but most people just sit there and they think about other things and they're just, you know, maybe they like the community aspect of it, but they don't really read the Bible, don't think about Jesus, they don't think about God. You know, they're just there going through the motions like they're doing, you know, everyone's on autopilot. That's when we talk about sheeple. Well, this is what the sheeple mentality comes from, where you're just, you know, you've checked out. Like most people just check out of their life at some point. You can pretty much, um, you know, do everything that you're doing in sleep mode, right? You just, you know, and then you're on some sort of, either you're taking ibuprofen on a daily basis, or, you know, alcohol and drugs, recreational drugs, or, you know, medication, whatever it might be you know, some sort of psychological medication people are on, something to help you sleep, right? And so you're just checked out, right? You can, you know, you can function in sleep mode, right? You're in sleep mode on your computer. You can barely, you know, you don't need high levels of consciousness to do what you're doing in your life. Your eyes are, you know, people's eyes get sort of glassed over and they're just, you know, disconnected from reality. If you just turn on the TV, and TV is a part of that as well, right? You get into this, you know, passive, your brain goes, goes into this passive alpha stage and you're just, you know, going through life, sleepwalking through life. You're not even really conscious, making conscious decisions. The government, your work tell you what to do, you know, your your spouse or whatever, you know, what's going on. You just have people, you know, expecting things from you and you're just ghouling it up, right? You're zombified and you're just walking through life in a daze. I mean, that's where all this stuff comes from. Because of the way the system's set up, it weakens you and drains you, and then you just never, um, you know, recover. That movie Joe versus a Volcano is like that, right? Where uh, it's not like a good movie, but I was looking at it, you know, a couple of, a year and a half ago, maybe, I don't know, when I was doing Tom Hanks videos. And it's, you know, it's this drudging, you know, drudge, dark, sort of dingy, you know, <laughs> lifelessly walking and trudging your way into work with your your co-workers and things and somewhere along the line you get a fear of being alive right you get a fear of um taking risks and you know you just you're just settling anything that's you know somewhat risky or somewhat um you know you're just afraid of getting hurt afraid of failing you know afraid of whatever it is i mean you have like you know these areas where poor people live and homeless people live and you know, you wonder if you end up being like that. So you're, you know, there's a fear of it. Like there's a fear of, you know, all these things. There's a fear of trying something, reaching up for something higher and, you know, failing and being less than and just, you know, a fear of being alive, right? People settle in relationships with people that are, you know, uninteresting and, you know, who they don't really, you know, love in any way. Maybe they learn to love on some level, but they don't have enough love in them their love bank is so drained by life their capacity to love but there's some attachment there right and then you know they either end up in divorce or in these relationships where they're barely connecting with the other person they might see the person every day and sleep next to them but there's no connection like they're just walking through like they're both in a couple of bumper cars right oblivious you know bubbles where they're oblivious to the people around them you know they don't have any contact with them, no meaningful interactions. And so when you start to homestead, and I'm not saying homesteading is the answer, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly not. But let's say, you know, in terms of your work, because like you have a purpose and a goal for your life. And most people don't have that, right? What's your overall purpose? What's your overall goal for your life? Like, why are you here? Like, what, what you know, what are you supposed to be doing here? And like, don't say something out of your religion you know, or something out of the American dream. Like, why are you here? Like, not not because an organization that you believe in 
or belong to tells you this is why you're here this is you know like, why are you really here like what you know inside of yourself why is your soul here why is your soul created this life why have you why are you you know stuck here on planet earth like what you know what's going on like you know what's your real purpose what's your soul's purpose your overall purpose here what are the things that you know in your smaller goals what are your abilities what do you have to offer your brothers and sisters in the planet and the universe what do you have to offer as a you know as an individual entity right as a you know persona what gifts do you have like everyone has to have something right every animal does something right if you go and you look at the natural world like bees are pollinating flowers and creating honey and things like this like you know cows graze they eat uh you know grass and they you know they um they poop out like fertilizer right urinate you know nitrogen and they give back to the environment right they help build topsoil and they help you know create you know plant life the nitrogen that they you know all these things right they die their bodies you know i mean salmon's another good example of this salmon that go up the creeks and things like this and they're eaten by eaten by predators and there's bones and they're you know what's left of their carcass goes into the the soil and creates high rich nitrogen in the soil i mean people spray fish oil like on their plants because of all the good things that are in fish and things right you have vultures that are eating away dead carcasses and things like this making sure there's no you know bacteria i mean everything has a purpose out there every animal has something that's contributing like what are you contributing like what are we contributing collectively what am i contributing as a person like what am i doing to you know somehow make the world a better place i mean almost every human being is making it worse and the worst thing that they're doing is their negative thoughts and their emotions are going out into the atmosphere and it's just contaminating like you can go to people's houses i was telling my wife about this you know i don't think i i might have said about this in a video but I had this ex-girlfriend and her family was so depressed. Her mom had, um, you know, she had been in love with some guy who went to Vietnam and she didn't want to wait for him to come back. She just married like the first guy that like wanted to, you know, interact with her. Right. She just, you know, married him and he was a complete loser. And um, he fathered two kids with her and then just took off. And um, this woman I was dating went to see him like she was in her 20s and she found out where he lived and she went to see him. He's like, oh, how come you haven't found how come you haven't, you know, come over and seen me? You know, like, like as a kid, it was her responsibility to find him and, you know, <laughs> seek him out. I mean, it's just, you know, he was just this selfish, you know, horrible person. Then her mom ma ma married maybe a worse guy who I met. And it was just this energy in the house. They had this like you know, this really obese um, beagle, like, you know, like a Snoopy, you know, the, the, the dog Snoopy. And when it walked, its belly dragged on the floor. And the mom was obese. She probably weighed like, you know, you know, 250, 300 pounds, short, not, not a tall person, like really obese, like something where she was having health issues. And this dog would um, like jump up on this very low couch and it would have to run back and it would just, you know, get its like, you know, its flab <laughs> moving in the right direction. And, it would, you know, it would just have to catapult itself. I was like watching this. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> what did I just see? I mean, it was like the saddest thing ever. Like they could barely move. Like I could, you know, like most dogs can outrun you, right? I mean, it's just depressed in there. The whole thing, you know, the environment and, you know. I mean, I have, you know, a bunch of stories about the thing, not, you know, that many, but I only went over that house twice and it was just, you know, a nightmare, just the energy in the house, you know, and I've always been somebody who watches and observes things and, you know, records them or whatever it is. Like, that's why I got all these stories and things. But anyways, you know, so I've seen this, you know, the effects of people not having a purpose or a goal. And I felt it myself. So the first 29 years of my life, I didn't have a purpose. Like I, you know, dropped out of college a couple of times and I just really didn't understand or get the American dream. And I felt like there was something more for me, some real purpose. And then I started the heartfulness meditation and I had this profound spiritual experience. It's like, you know, a transformational experience that I want to talk about 
you know, that aspect of it in some future video. And then I, you know, realized that I had a spiritual purpose here, that I was, you know, to return to the source, to connect with God, that my soul had, you know, a reason for being here. And through the Heartfulness Meditation System, I could reach that goal, but was more important just to have a goal, like just to have a purpose. And then all the other things, the other things that you do in life, the things that you do out of duty, the things that you do in terms of your employment, things that you do throughout your, you know, other aspects of your existence now have, you know, have a meaning because they're, you know, things that you have to endure, they're tasks and things that you have to, you know, evolve through no matter how unpleasant to reach this, you know, eventual goal of merging back in the source, returning to your creator. They're part of the path, right? They're part of something that you have to go through. Like Babaji, the second master of the system, there was um, the person that started me, the trainer started me. I used to go over his house and I got my original, you know, meditative sittings with him. And he would tell stories of his time in India and conversations he had with Babaji. And, you know, the master Charji was the, the master of the system now, you know, back then in, in the 80s, in the, uh, the 90s, since 1993 to 1994. In 1995, I was there about, I believe, two years. And so um, he was, he went to Babaji this one time and he was really bummed with his job. Like he just, you know, hated his job. And he was, you know, and he said, he was talked to Babaji about it. And in the, you know, in the heartfulness system, there's a distinction, certainly in India, where poverty and just, um, I mean, people like, you know, having a job and locking in a secure job is, so important it's a fear-based system in this way because of the massive amount of people and all these things very competitive job market and so um there's a distinct there's a you know a distinction between work your life's work and your purpose in the heartfulness system which is your spiritual purpose and what you do for money you know what you would do because this is the the monetary system you've been born into whether it's a good system or not it's a bad system, like, you know, I mean, but you don't think about that because that's what you have to deal with, right? And so Babaji said to him, well, is it pay a good wage? And the guy said, yeah. He goes, well, if you find a, a job that pays a better wage, take that one. And then Babaji looked off into the distance and said, this cleaning will be over soon. And he talked in terms of cleaning, like this was just something that you had to go through. And the preceptor, the trainer said to me, yeah, it was five years. Like it was five years after he said that, that he had to do that job, right? And so, you know, there's this, you know, a different way of looking at it when you are engaged in a spiritual process. When the, you know, when everything that you're doing in life and everything that you're facing in life is, you know, a part of your spiritual journey, then there's a purpose to it. It's not just some boring job that is, you know, I mean, you're working for your free time so you can meditate and connect to God and, you know, go on your spiritual purpose. But the job itself, while you're doing the job, like there's this practice of constant remembrance in the heartfulness system where you have this idea that, you know, it's not you but God, you know, the master within that is experiencing whatever you're going through, right? Whatever you're, you know, whatever work you're doing, that you're sharing that experience with God. So you're changing the way that you go about your job. Like you go about your, you know, whatever you're doing in your life. Like you're, it's something that you and God are experiencing together. And it's something that your soul wants you to experience. And just taking this, um, this attitude towards your, you know, the less fun parts of your life helps to endure them because there's a purpose behind it, right? It's not something that is happening, happening randomly to you. You're not a victim of it. It's something that your soul and God have, in a sense, signed off on. And if they haven't, right, if you're not supposed to be doing that, like if you're not supposed to endure something, or it's something that you can experience for a shorter time and then, you know, move on to something better, then that's, you know, then that's much more possible now because you're, you're looking at it in a different way, right? You're not trapped. You're not bound to your mundane job, your crappy relationship, or whatever it is, right? It's something that you can experience and have the experience, 
get it cleaned out of your samskaric system. I've talked about samskaras before, impressions from previous existences or whatever it might be. Experience what you're supposed to experience and then move on to something else, right? It's something that's much more temporary. That the negativity that you're experiencing in the outer world is cleaning something out of your internal system. It's mirroring something. It's feeding back something that you have in your internal system that has to go. And so once it's cleaned out of your internal system, then you don't have to experience it in the world anymore. And so it's a complete different orientation to life, right? That these things that, you know, make up people's purpose because, you know, so much of your career and your marital relationship and your family make up your purpose on this planet, right? You think about your job, it's for money, right? The purpose is to obtain money and maybe some recognition you get, you know, some position, you know, I mean, the money can be used to buy a fancy car or a house or something that you can, you know, show that, look at, look at what, this is me, this is what I've accomplished, this is what I've been able to do, right? It's some validation, or you can get some sort of awards, like the stupid Oscars or, you know, trophies. I got a couple of trophies when I was a kid, you know, I was like, look at them, they were hollow, and, you know, they, I was like, what does this even mean, right? Like, my brother and I were walking by a, um, a like a, a, a karate studio, you know, some sort of martial arts studio. And they had all these trophies in the windows. And he said, the first thing you do when you want to open up a martial arts studio is you go to Mr. Trophy, right? <laughs> like you can go to a trophy store and just make up something and they'll make a trophy for you. And you can put the trophies in your house and say, you know, look at what I am, right? This is me. Look at I, I'm not a loser. I've got these trophies. And so you know, you have these things in life that you use to validate yourself, to make you feel like, you know, you're, you're, you have some, you know, worth or merit, right? That you've succeeded. You're not a loser. You're a winner, right? Look at the trophies. I got it. I got, you know, I got these things that validate my existence. And, you know, money and, and success and all these things are about that. But in reality, the only thing that validates your existence is if you do what God wants you to do. If you come down and live the life you're supposed to live and you move forward on your spiritual journey and God and your soul are, you know, you're congruent with your soul's purpose and God's purpose for you, that's the only thing that makes you feel good about yourself. That's the only thing like on a deep level that you're doing what you're, you know, you're you're having a successful life. That you came down with a spiritual purpose, your soul has a purpose for you, you found that purpose and you're, you know, you're moving forward along that path. That's the only thing that's going to make somebody feel good about themselves. That's the only thing on a deep level, right? You can, you know, distract yourself all you want, right? I mean, people can rationalize anything. But on a deep level where you feel, you know, all right, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And those people that feel that way, it's a completely different life than everybody else that does it. The lost, right? The people who are lost, who are not fulfilling their purpose, their spiritual purpose. And what the lost fear most is that someday somebody's going to show them that they're not doing what they're supposed to do, right? (laughs) That their, you know, life is a joke and they're going the wrong direction and, you know, it's all been for nothing. I mean, this is the majority of people don't want to hear that at all. So that's why they fear God. They fear because they connect with God like all the things that they've been repressing psychologically, they've developed defense mechanisms not to, you know, face the the fact that they're going in the wrong direction. They're making the planet worse and they're going backwards spiritually and they're disconnected from their souls and God. And they are, you know, functioning on a very remedial level. And they don't want to hear that shit. Like nobody wants to hear that, right? <laughs> and so it's, you know, a cold slap of reality that has to happen for somebody to, you know, something has to happen that's a shock to their system to get them to face, you know, the fact that they're going in the wrong direction. And the system are 100% dependent on. And again, when you don't have enough internal resources, your love bank is, is empty, your prana, your, you know, your godly energy has been drained out of you by the beast and your, you know, mundane tasks. And you don't have any energy in your inside yourself and you're just worn out and you're just... You're going through life like an automaton, right? Just, you know, going through the motions. You've checked out. 
like you just don't have enough to turn the tide, right? To turn the, you know, to turn your life around, to turn your existence around. And so people don't want to hear these things, right? That's why people have trouble with my YouTube channel because eventually I'm going to say something that triggers that defense mechanism that people realize that, you know, they haven't been going in the right direction, right? That, you know, everything's been a lie because, you know, it's easy to look at other people in the truth community, look at, you know, Joe Biden or the Democrats or people look at Trump or, you know, whatever it is, and, you know, to project the problem of their existence out to the political world or Hollywood or wherever it might be and, you know, wait for those people to change, you know, <laughs> make your life about those people changing or those people getting their, you know, comeuppance, those people getting what they deserve. But most people can't look in the mirror and see, you know, the dysfunction in their own system, their own life, and then find their way back onto their spiritual path. I mean, that's why the transmission's given in the heartfulness system. It's sort of like a, you know, Hail Mary for the human race, where there is this divine energy that's being transmitted through the master and trainers of the system, this, you know, this pure God's love to help people, you know, get enough energy back in their system. It reboots their system. It gives them a chance to, you know, sort of live again, right? To, you know, come out of their stupor and, you know, come back to life in a sense, right? And regain their spiritual purpose and a connection with God in their soul. Like without the transmission, if people just had to will themselves to do it, it would be impossible. Even with the transmission, people quit, people don't, don't follow through. I mean, they feel it and they, you know, the people who benefit I'm talking about. There's some people that they're just, their hearts are hard, and they're too distracted and they're too far gone. And so they don't feel the transmission or cleaning and, you know, they're maybe not mature enough, whatever it is, right? Whatever reason that they can't feel it and they can't move forward, but they, they don't benefit. They don't, they don't have any conscious, you know, feeling that it's beneficial to them. And so, of course, they're going to quit. Like, why would you stay if you, you don't feel benefit? But then there's people who feel benefit. They sleep better and they can, you know, immediately feel like this is the right thing and it's helping them. Like just, you know, right off the bat. And the more they do it, the better it feels. And then at some point, they still quit, right? I mean, it's a, a very difficult thing to, you know, change the programming you've received at the hands of the beast. Change your indoctrination and, you know, go in a different direction. But what's happened now is the system is no longer going to provide for people. And, you know, there's so many different changes technologically, robots taking over people's jobs and the internet and how that's affected people and social media and all these things. Big changes. I mean, they just happened, so we've accepted them. But we don't even realize how, you know, astronomically different things are now than they were. I mean, I'm talking on a material level in terms of 5G, and people spending most of their time, most of their conscious hours in the cyber universe, right? Not living, a, you know, not in the real world type of stuff. You know, there's a, there's a name for it, right? Like that's how much things have changed. Like my son told me, my son said IRL. Was that in the IRL? I'm like, what's in the IRL? What's the IRL? He goes, in the real world. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> We're now abbreviating the in the real world like you have to ask. Like most people assume things happen in the cyber world, right? Oh, that happened IRL, in the real world. Like, it's a, you know, it's an anomaly. You know, everything used to happen in the real world. I mean, that's how gone people are. That's how people have just checked out. They're not even spending most of their times in the real world. And so, you know, with the economic collapse and the collapse of the human being in terms of morality, the collapse of the family, the degraded social and cultural changes we've seen. These are epic changes. A lot of this happened under Trump Why people on the, you know, that would have put up some sort of fight or opposition to this. We're waiting for the big, you know, the great pumpkin to make America great again, right? All that stuff. The QBs and the Trumpers or whatever. I mean, so like there was no opposition to it. And so and the left was so triggered by Trump, they just pushed all this stuff through. We now have a Hollywood morality, which is, you know, these changes are epic, and they've happened inside people. Like people inside themselves, kids today are so much different than you inside themselves because they've grown up on the internet, and they're even more lost than you can imagine, right? 
and you're starting to see it, but it's what's happening on the inside of people. But then there's the breakdown of the system itself. And so this system that most people, you know, most people think they don't get enough. They don't get enough free time. They don't get enough vacation. They don't get enough, you know, time at the beach or the mountains or whatever it is. They don't get enough time away. They don't get enough pleasure, right? They don't get enough stimulation. It's about to get suckier. It, like your your life and what you can do and, you know, wait till there's, um, you know, massive power outages and things like this coming or just the shutdown of the electrical grid in places or whatever it is, right? Where people just won't have even the little bit that they had before. Food shortages and just across the board. And that's going to happen. That's happening right now. It's happening in other places of the world. It's happening in America. And when that happens, then it becomes a, a choice point because are you going to just accept less and go, you know, even, you know, deeper into your, you know, abyss of checking out or whatever? Are you going to just check out completely or are you going to change your orientation to this world? Are you going to come up with a real reason for being alive, a spiritual reason? Are you going to, you know, there's this, you know, the heartfulness system is available and it's more than just the heartfulness system because when everything goes south, there won't be a way for people to connect to the heartfulness system on the internet or even hear about it in the same way, right? And so they're going to have to connect on a spiritual level. So they might never know the heartfulness system and never be able to meet the master of the system or even other people doing it. I mean, people will just start doing this stuff in private. They'll start meditating and feeling things in their heart. And so the organization itself isn't as important as the practice and, you know, actually con the connection. Because there's people who connect with the organization but never connect in their hearts. They never make the connection. They never, you know, really... You know, dive into it. They say they're doing heartfulness, but they're not really, right? They're not, you know, they've never, you know, found a way on a soul level, maybe, you know, just because they're, they're somehow connected on a soul level. I mean, that's one of the great things about the heartfulness system. Even if you're not doing the practice efficiently or the way that you should do it, your soul still gets connected and receives a transmission. And so that'll help in a future existence or maybe even later on, like it'll bear some fruit. But again, it's about connecting on a heart level. And then people have done that without ever hearing about the system. Some people have been doing heartfulness for a couple of years and they'll hear about it and they didn't know they were doing it. They didn't know that, you know, they closed their eyes and they were, you know, feeling some vibration. This happened to me. Like I was feeling things in my heart for a year before I started the heartfulness system. And I didn't know why. I was like, what's going on? I felt vibrations. And, you know, I was like, sometimes I would, I would try to meditate because I did some you know, like a physical yoga class. And I would get almost like, I'd feel this, not almost like, it was like nausea in my heart. And like, I was like, you know, like having almost like a physical vomit of like nausea it was this grossness getting cleaned out in preparation of my first sittings. And so, you know, there is a path out of the, you know, so-called abyss of what's happening right now. But people have to choose to change. They have to, you know, open up to the possibility that, you know, life is going to be different, you know, not just the physical experience, your material experience of life, but your internalized experience of life and changing the way you go about things, like starting with, you know, everything, right? Like how do you, you know, what you think about and your orientation and your purpose in life. And so these are the real changes. Like this is, you know, there's a system where people are going to get, you know, caught in a sense, like, you know, not physically cut, but in terms of not making the grade, right? Again, massive population reduction. That's, you know, part of what's happening right now. And there's only limited spots, you know, the, the birth rate's going to go way down. We, you know, they're already doing things. And I mean, this isn't, you know, something that's completely or even controlled by what the, what we call the controllers. This is a part of God's plan that there needs to be a reduction in the amount of people because so many people, you know, so much negative energy coming from the lost, you know, the moaning masses, as Babaji, the second master, referred to humanity, the moaning masses, people who are lost and, you know, don't have any way to get back on track. And that's most people. And so there's going to be massive population reduction in one way or another, like that's coming, whatever, you know, whatever way that manifests that's happening. 
And there's going to be so many available spots to come back to planet Earth. Again, you have to, you know, understand that reincarnation's a real thing. I mean, you, you know, you die somewhere, you have to be born somewhere else, right? One thing ends and you have to reincarnate. Your soul has to go somewhere. Your soul's in your body now. Where is it going next? And your religion has given you a bunch of bullshit about that, right? Like promises they can't keep. And so, you know, where's your soul really going next, right? You get away from the bullshit religious promises because, you know, that's just stuff to make you feel psychologically satisfied that you've taken care of your religious in your afterlife, right? Oh, they'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, well, you know, they're just, you know, the flim flam man promising you things they can't deliver. Well, no, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> now you've upset me. Like, you know, and so, um, you know, like your soul's going somewhere afterwards. And if there's limited space here in terms of limited bodies, limited human beings, if you're going from 8 billion to 1 billion or less even, maybe, who knows, there's, a, you know, for every, you know, baby that's born, there's seven, seven souls trying to come back, right? And the ones that are, you know, are have some positive movement, who have, you know, moved to a higher level of consciousness and they're getting back, tra getting back on track spiritually and they have some potential, they're going to be the ones that are, you know, given the the option of coming back to life on planet Earth. I don't know what's going to happen to the rest of the souls. I can't imagine it'll be a good thing because when, you know, you're, you're not able to make it back into this shithole. <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to make it back into this shithole. Then like, where are you going to go? If the Earth is, you know, above you, if you're not good enough for planet Earth, then where are you going to go, right? And so um, there's that. So this is the choice point that I've talked about, my book, The Choice. You know, and the choice is scary for most people for the, all the, you know, things I've laid out here, right? And just so much more than that. Like you've been woven into, you know, you've been made into a cog in the wheel and there's a lot of fear of like going outside of being that cog. I mean, you can still perform the same function. You can still do the same job and have the same life and have the same family, but your orientation is different. The way that you're experiencing it inside is different, and that's really scary for people. And so, you know, but there needs to be this movement. Like people have to be given this opportunity and choice because otherwise, you know, there's this is like a, this is the moment of truth, right? Like I was going to maybe call this video the moment of truth, but I think I'll call it like if you're not good enough for planet Earth, <laughs> then where are you going to go? Right? And so, you know, what I was saying, though, is that there is a choice point now because humanity can't go in this direction anymore. The Kali Yuga is coming to an end. The power structure is being taken down. The system is collapsing. So humanity has to go in one of two directions. It's either going to go up or down. It's either going to go towards God or go into some demonic phase, right? It's going to, you know, either be allowed to continue on this planet or be wiped off into extinction. I mean, whatever way that you look at it, you can see that it's coming to a head. And it's really hard to see for most people the spiritual option. They just see, you know, the bad materialistic system. They see the controllers. They just see, you know the bad stuff, but the good stuff's there. There's a movement that's happening inside people. There's an opportunity here. Like if you do the heartfulness meditation, you start feeling this, right? That there is something else going on. There's a, you know, a real movement that's happening, but it's hard to detect, right? It's not something that's, you know, out there and prevalent in our society. It's ha and it has to happen internally. And so this is the choice point. And this is whether you, human beings are going to move up to a higher level of evolution on a spiritual level, because there is evolution, but not in the way that Darwin said it. It's not about, you know, some physical manifestation, although animals do do that, right? My wife and I had recently just seen um, a, a, a legless lizard. It looks like a snake, but it's got the head of a lizard, and there's lots of them, and somehow they have evolved or de-evolved and lost their legs, right? This happens, you know, animals and things adjust themselves on a physical level 
Of course, the transformation of things like frogs and butterflies, tadpole to a frog and, you know, caterpillar to a butterfly. I mean, so as there is this sense of sort of growth and change and evolution on a physical level, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about spiritual level evolution and a change in your consciousness, and then your physical body will reflect that, right? I've talked about the I've talked about this, you know, a genetic modification that is, you know, created by a spiritual evolution. And so it's scary for people. I mean, it's going to be scary because, you know, you've been dragged in the wrong direction and people are just lost. And, it, you know, they're not even going to understand what it feels like at first, right? I mean, it's going to make them feel unsettled. And so, you know, it's whether people can rise up. People, you know, human beings, because of our, you know, we're a, uh, the product of genetic modification of making, you know, a slave race on planet Earth, and there's so much fear and anxiety and, you know, animalistic tendencies and things, that it's difficult for people. I mean, so often people choose the lower. People are attracted to the lower. They're attracted to the dark side. They're attracted to, you know, demonic and, you know, devil-like things, right? They're attracted to go away from God. They're not attracted to God. They fear God. And so this is, you know, one of the problems on planet Earth. But it's a choice point. Like this material collapse, this apocalypse, this apocalypse isn't about the system. It's about people choosing to either go up or down, you know, to move forward or just be erased from the equation. And, you know, I mean, there's a, the, the X factor here is people's ability to choose. And we'll see what happens. Like, you know, I'm I'm optimistic, but I'm also realistic, right? <laughs> and, you know, it's not really anything to do with me. I just need to do my personal work, do my personal service, and move forward. And we'll just see, you know, the chips will fall where they may. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely reporting for the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.